Welcome to the full story series. You see, we here at Comic Story and take a long time to get through an entire story arc sometimes, as the issues take months and sometimes entire years to come out to complete the full story. So we bring you out pieces as we're going, and once they're done, you can find the whole story in our playlist. Well, Doomsday Clock took about two years to complete. So today we're going to bring you issues 1 through 12 of the Doomsday Clock, which is the merger of the Watchmen characters into the DC Universe, and it seems to be affecting a lot of stuff. Hope you guys enjoy. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. The riots increase. The streets in front of Vita are flooded with people. Signs and torches are waved. It is 1992 and they have learnt what he did in the past. The police aren't enough. The windows shatter. The crowds rush in. Gunfire erupts. The world is on the brink of utter destruction. And Adrian Vita's office is empty. The world hunts for a man who killed more than three million people with his plan to unite the planet. Special forces move in on Viet's base in the Arctic, but it is empty. Nothing but the sounds of horror that grip the planet in the news. Nuclear war is a certainty. Prison guards rush through the corridors to evacuate. One of the prisoners reaching through the bars, yelling to be released. The guard is punched from the side and the keys retrieved from his body. Fear crosses the prisoner's face as he backs up. You still want out? Rorschach asks, dangling the keys, but the man backs up. I'm cool. Rorschach moves through the prison. It's the last day on earth and he's hungry. His routine was thrown off this morning and he couldn't eat his pancakes. Syrup was cold. He stops in front of a door marked 13. Was it 13? No, 31. He keeps walking. He stops at door 31, turning the key. Elsewhere in the world, the keys to the missiles are turned. Rorschach opens the door, and the woman inside stares at him from the shadows. Eureka Manson, the marionette. The woman backs away, but Rorschach moves forward. They only have three hours, 36 minutes until the prison will be turned to ash. You, you said you'd throw me down an elevator shaft the next time we met. She stammers, backing away, and Rorschach laughs. <laughs> Wasn't me. Different guy. Marionette tells him to prove it, but he's sick of proving it. And he simply removes his glove, showing the dark skin underneath. He hands her an envelope that is sticky with syrup. Payment for a job. Marionette opens the envelope, discovering the picture of a child. Come with me. Do job. Find out where the boy is. Anger flashes and the woman rushes him, demanding to know where her son is. But he doesn't know. His partner does. She just has a job to do. Find God. Save the world. And if she does the job, she'll find her son. But Marionette isn't leaving without her husband. The mine. Where is he? Further in the prison, the prisoners have all begun to kill the guards and worse. Hey, Billy, the mute has given you the evil eye. One tells his buddy. Look it up. They see Marcos Miaz sitting quietly in his cell. You got something to say? The thug yells, stalking into the cell. But he doesn't talk. Everyone knows that the mine doesn't talk. They pick him up and they beat him. Blows raining down on his face and his stomach. He sags against them. Baby! Marionette calls out to him from a window with Rorschach over her shoulder. She knows that he's in the middle of a performance, but they gotta go. Suddenly, Mime isn't sagging anymore. Bones break and blood splatters as he takes apart the group of prisoners, finally ending with a flourish and a big smile on his face. Finally meeting up, Rorschach tells them, Reunions have to wait. Cause trouble, I take an eye. But they can't leave without Mime's weapons, so they go to lockup and Mime smiles as he picks up nothing. You have problems. The group escapes into the words and Marionette continually asks questions, but Vorschak refuses to answer. He leads them to his getaway car, which, judging by the smell, also acts as his home and his bathroom. They drive back into the city, the place that everyone is trying to escape from. Riots and looting continue, but the group escape into the sewers quickly. The tunnels are dark and Vorschak seems to be easily confused, trying to remember if it's left or right. Mime draws a gun that doesn't exist from a belt that he's not wearing. Don't point imaginary guns at me. Rorschach warns, and finally they take the right, coming to a large door. Rorschach gives it a single knock. With a rusty grind, the door opens, revealing the light to them. The three walk into the remains of the night owl's lair, and Marionette is shocked, questioning whether the rumors of the real Rorschach killing Night Owl and Silk Spectre before killing himself happened. Night Owl is retired, and Rorschach is working for me, Adrian Vett says from behind them. Stepping into the light, Ozymandias is disappointed that Mayan is with them, but he's not surprised. Marionette angrily stalks across the room, threatening to kill the fake Rorschach and Vet if they don't tell her where his son is. Adrian doesn't look scared. 
he's happy to pay them, to tell them the location of their son after the job is done. He begins to tell them of his plan though, while the world outside continues to spiral in self-destruction, and he's suddenly racked in pain. You see, Adrian, aka Ozymandias, has cancer, and it's spreading. It cannot save our world, though there is one who has the power to. Dr. Manhattan, and no one has seen him in years. That is our mission. We must find John, wherever he is retreated to. In another world, Clark Kent is asleep in his apartment in Metropolis. He dreams of his youth, of a night at the prom, the night his parents died in a tragic car accident, and he awakens to Lois calling his name as he floats above the bed. He was screaming. Lois is scared. She can't remember the last time that Superman had a nightmare. And to make matters worse, when asked, he tells her, I don't think I've ever had one. The box of mime and marionette costumes plop onto the floor. When the Minutemen showed up in 39, every wannabe gangster and low-rent thug rented a mask, Marionette explains, as she paused through their old gear. She remembers a time when you could go and buy a costume and a name from a tailor in the city. Rorschach just looks on as the two criminals continue to put on their costume. You're giving them their costumes? Expecting what? He asks Vet, who is working on Night Owl's old ship. Cooperation, the genius tells him. Expecting is a lot, is the growled response. Rorschach looks on at the villains, and he knows that they see the world through a different lens, that they need to be watched closely. Quickly, Mime and Marionette don their costumes, putting on the makeup that will finish their look. In the past, the villains attacked a bank, and one of the tellers would look out from her cubicle, her hand reaching down to touch the silent alarm button. She jumps back up as Mime shoves her face into the glass, glaring at her. Please! I didn't do anything! She screams. He shakes his finger at her before headbutting the glass, shattering it in her face. He holds his weapon, pointing a non-existent gun at her. What do you want? She questions. Marionette walks over, reaching through the shattered glass to take a picture of the woman and her son. The woman begins to babble, but Marionette tells her to be quiet and look at the person who can open the vault. The villain looks over her shoulder, seeing the bank manager who is standing amongst the crowd. Thanks a lot, Julie! He cries in anger, but it doesn't matter. The manager tells him that it is on a timed lock and it won't open until tomorrow. Marionette looks bored, turning back to the frightened teller in her booth. Julia, is it? She asks, still holding the photo of the woman's son. Julia lets out a squeak and tells him that the manager is lying, that he can open the safe anytime. The man charges across the room, yelling that Julia is fired after this, and Marionette smiles as the man continues to rant and rave. A simple clap of her hands and a single wire dangles between them. She flips through the air, bringing that wire down, slicing through the finger that the manager is using to point at everyone. And the man screams as the villain pulls him in close, shushing him. I know, I know. My slicing wire hurts. Now, did you know how to open up the vault? The air in the room suddenly charges and it crackles and everyone's hair suddenly stands up as they look around in shock and blue light suddenly fills the room with energy bouncing off the walls as Dr. Manhattan fills it. Mime stalks forward, his non-existent pistol pointing at the hero, but Manhattan reaches his hand out, pointing. Suddenly, Marionette jumps in the way. She yells at the hero, telling him that he can't kill Mime without killing her, and Manhattan cocks his head, as if staring at something that he doesn't understand. He can hear the second heartbeat coming from her uterus. Meanwhile, back in Night Owl's old lair, Marionette is back in the current day, staring down at a picture of a son that they took from her. Rorschach ignores them, watching the video of the pair's final heist. He doesn't understand why Manhattan didn't kill them. He knows that the hero has killed for less. That is precisely the point of Rorschach, Adrian tells him. I know Dr. Manhattan, and I even managed to convince him to leave the Earth once. Now, I need to convince him to come back. He explains that Marionette represents a moment in John's past, one that I will use to remind him of who he was. Suddenly, the screens go staticky, and Adrian turns to see Rorschach. Four hours are up. Are the nukes in the air? Rorschach looks down at his watch as Adrian powers up the machine. Sorry, watch is slow. The machine lights up, and Adrian beckons to the two villains to get on board. Outside, the city streets are filled with rioters and looters as the end of the world nears, and one points to the sky as Night Owl's old vehicles takes to the air. The missiles cruise towards the city as the owl ship takes flight, with Adrian babbling about the technology that will take them through the quantum tunnel. Everyone, hold on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. The missile hits the city, blowing apart the buildings and people in a fiery blast. The owl ship shakes, it shudders, the blast hitting the hard hull, and then the world falls apart. Meanwhile, 
Bruce Wayne looks dismissively at the Rorschach image before him. A boat, he answers. The doctor nods, holding up the next one. A yacht. Another of the images is then held up. A speedboat. Finally, the doctor puts the test down, questioning what is on Bruce's mind. I've got a friend waiting for me at the marina, he answers. And I don't like to keep her waiting, so if I could get your stamp of approval, or whatever it is you need to do, I could be on my way. The billionaire answers with a bored smile. Walking out, he falls into step with his old friend, Lucius Fox. Then he drops the bored billionaire act. That's the last time that I'm doing this, he tells him. But Lucius explains what is going on in the company. If Bruce won't have more of a presence, then he could be voted out by the board. But Bruce knows this. They need to be prepared for the worst. Gotham needs Batman. The two look down into the streets, and the people of Gotham seem to think otherwise, though. They're protesting everywhere with anti-Batman slogans and images of the vigilante being hung everywhere. The world has gone upside down from the Superman theory. They don't trust Batman anymore, Lucius tells him, and Bruce looks up into the night sky, seeing the signal flashing into the night. When have they ever? Over in the city, the owl ship bursts through the cloud coverage and trembles as it heads towards the Earth, bouncing off a building and careening down its path. It smashes through an old, closed-down Ferris wheel until it finally comes to a creaking stop in the old carnival. Inside, Adrian finally comes awake as a spark pops over his head, and he turns, looking through the dark cabin to find Rorschach on the floor. Trying to shake him, Adrian jumps back, startled as Rorschach comes to life with anger. Adrian! He gasps. Kill you. Adrian pushes through the man's confusion, finally getting him to calm down. What happened? Rorschach gasps, and Adrian smiles and nods. I brought us to the universe that Dr. Manhattan traveled to. Now you and I will have to fight him. Rorschach struggles to his feet, nodding to the two villains that they remain unconscious on the floor. What about them? Quickly, the duo grabs and handcuffs a mine and marionette to the owl ship. What's going on? Marionette snarls as she comes awake. Adrian quickly explains that they need to make sure that the two villains stay put long enough for them to find John. He opens up a compartment, revealing his small creature, who simply meows at him. Right, wiper and cat. Leave pet here with other animals. Adrian explains that the animal isn't a simple pet, that she is a compass that will lead them to John. And stepping out into the streets of Gotham, the pair start their quest, with finally Adrian stopping to pick up a newspaper. Hmm. A city is called Gotham, he tells his companion. Gotham? Yes, I know. The two stare at the world around them, which isn't wholly different from their own. They need to catch up on the world that they have found themselves in and quickly head to the Gotham City Library. Inside, the pair look at one of the computers where Adrian discovers the major differences between their worlds. The biggest difference is the sheer number of men and women wearing masks, he tells Rorschach. I believe that it is possible that Dr. Manhattan could be one of these heroes, possibly wanting a second chance to save the world. He continues to search through the computer, realizing that they have to find someone to help them on this world. I have identified two of the smartest people on the planet, Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne. Rorschach nods, suggesting that they split up. It'll be quicker. Which one do you want? Adrian grins. The smartest, of course. Meanwhile, at Wayne Manor, Rorschach slips quietly through a window, making his way through the dark manor until he finds a stack of pancakes in the kitchen. He sits in the study, ready to dig into his impromptu meal, but a loose piece of paper suddenly blows across the floor by a draft. The hero investigates, finding a draft coming from beneath an old grandfather clock. He notes the time, seeing that it's wrong, and then he yanks, pulling the hidden door open and heading down into the dark cave. Meanwhile, in the city, Batman looks up as a sensor from the cave suddenly goes off in his cowl. And at LexCorp, Lex Luthor enters his office to discover someone standing there. Excuse me, how did you get in here? Adrian doesn't even bother to look at him. I let myself in. I am the smartest man on my earth, and you are the smartest man on yours. Quickly, he explains the past events to Luther, filling him in on everything that happened up to this point, and finally, Luther turns to the man who invaded his office. If you are the smartest man on your earth, then I hate to meet the dumbest. Suddenly, he senses movement from behind, and Adrian dodges out of the way as a gun goes off in the shadows. The round hits Luther, and Adrian turns shocked to see who is stepping out of the darkness. Last time you came at me, I was confused. Drunk. The comedian smiles around his cigar as he holds up the pistol. This time, I'm ready for you, Adrian. In the cave, Rorschach wanders through, admiring the various keepsakes that Batman has kept here over the years, and then he senses movement and turns around. You ate my breakfast, Batman comments. Yeah, I did. 
The bottle of gin smashes hard against the wall, shattering, with Edward Blake staggering as Adrian cracks him across the jaw. He keeps coming, smashing his head against the picture frame, knocking him to the ground with the blood dripping from his mouth and nose as the man lifts him off the ground, throwing him hard through the window and into the night air. He falls, plummeting towards the hard cement below. The air rushes past him as the ground comes up fast, and he hits the water hard. It shocks him. His mouth, his nose filled with cold, salty seawater. He comes up gasping, shocked to see the sun over the city that he doesn't recognize. And finally, he arrives on a beach. He falls, taking huge gulps of fresh air. Hello, Blake. A voice calls out to him. He struggles to get up, still confused how he was here. Ozzy Mandy has just battled against him in his own penthouse apartment. He should be dead. Doc? He questions between gasps. What am I doing here? present day. The two begin to fight in Lex Luthor's office as the billionaire lays on the ground bleeding. Blake blocks a kick and knocks Adrian into the window hard enough to crack it. Ha! Wish I had a goddamn camera! That stupid look in your face! Adrian jumps, hitting the light switch on Luthor's desk, plunging them into darkness. Blake just laughs again. He's never been afraid of the dark. He is the comedian. A pen comes flying out of the shadows, slashing the comedian across the face, and Adrian comes at him attacking now, throwing a kick and a punch at his enemy. Clearly, John has something to do with this. Where is he? More blows hit Edward Blake staggering, and with Adrian slipping on the blood, his next blow missing, giving the comedian a chance to counterattack. Blake draws a pistol, rapidly firing, with the rounds missing Adrian each time as he dodges. He smiles, drawing another pistol. But Adrian doesn't give him time, leaping through the open window, plummeting to the earth below. He tucks, he rolls, he bounces off the overhang to slow himself, and then he leaps across the street, landing on a window-cleaning scaffolding that snaps beneath him. Another swing, another roll, he finally comes to a stop as he slams on the roof of a parked car and blacks out. You shouldn't be here, Batman tells Rorschach. You are trespassing in a very dangerous place. Rorschach tries to explain to Batman why he came, that he needs his help, but his words come up broken and confused. Finally, the heroes stop, taking his head into his hands. Wait, easier to explain. He begins, his hands starting to reach through his pockets, and he mumbles as he searches, bringing looks of concern to Batman, when finally the man pulls out a beaten up leather journal. Kovac's journal, please read this. Elsewhere in the city, Mime and Marionette step free of the owl ship, their cuffs laying useless on the floor. Adrian has no idea who we are. Marionette curses as she steps out. Never should have joined that freak show before he told us where our boy was. The two walk through the carnival, finally stopping when they see the lights of Gotham in the distance. This ain't Jersey. Come on, lover. Let's get a drink. Back at the cave, Rorschach stands by as Batman is sitting reading the journal. He checks his watch. What page are you on? He finally asks, and Batman turns, staring at the intruder. Four. That's it. With a sigh, Batman finally tells him that he should go upstairs and get some rest. Meanwhile, at the old folks' home, several of the seniors are yelling at the television as the reporter discusses the protests in Gotham, where the citizens are calling for Batman to reveal his identity. An old man stands up, staring at the window into the night. Mr. Thunder? Mr. Thunder, you need to eat your dinner, he tells him, but Mr. Thunder just tells the man that he's all right. My granddaughter and son are coming to take me out. Meanwhile, the seniors continue to yell as the news switches to discussions about the Superman theory, which has said that certain metahumans were created on purpose for something called the Department of Metahuman Affairs. The orderly tries to convince Mr. Thunder to eat. It's after 10 o'clock. But I wore my best suit, he whispers sadly. Back in Wayne Manor, Rorschach stops looking into the guest room. Hmm. He grumbles, and he explains that he didn't need a big room. Yes, well, I've taken you to every guest room that we have. Alfred begins as he enters the room behind the man. And this is the smallest. Alfred offers to take the man's clothes and make him some tea, but Rorschach isn't much of a tea drinker, instead asking for more pancakes. Alfred finally walks out of the room, leaving Rorschach to his own devices. And once he's finally alone, he takes off his mask, revealing the face beneath. Stepping into the bathroom and starting a hot shower. He needs to get clean. He needs to wash it off. He scrubs his head harder and harder. Blood begins to drip down, but it still isn't enough. And he scrubs harder and harder. In Gotham City, a lone comedian stands on a stage at the Jumping Jack's bar. He cracks a joke and a bottle sails out of the crowd, cutting into his face and knocking him down. About time we got a laugh! Someone from the crowd shouted as the laughter fills the room. Well, isn't this place lovely? Marionette comments as they step through the door. She orders a drink but doesn't get to walk in very far before someone is shouting at her. What do you think you're doing here? A big man asks. You can't wear makeup in here like that. The boss don't like it. The big man glares at them, showing his hand tattoo that proclaims that this is the Joker's turf. Marionette looks confused, asking who this Joker was, waving everyone's sudden anger. 
You all don't need to stand up. We just want a drink, she says, turning away from the goons. But the big man is there, one hand pulling her head back, while the other places the knife to her cheek. You disrespect the boss like that? I'm going to cut a smile into your pretty face. Mime steps up, his non-existent gun pointing at the man's face, and the other goons laugh with the man sneering at him. Mime pulls the trigger, but there's no sound, and a bright flash erupts from the empty air and the man falls, a bullet passing through his skull. Mime grins, turning the gun on the rest of the crowd. The goons all jump him, but he twists, firing again. He twists again, dodging a bottle and firing, and his hand flicks as a knife is being held in it. And another thug drops, blood pouring out of a stab wound in his throat. Marionette collapses, pulling her slicing string out. She twists and dances, cutting off a man's face, severing the barrel of a gun and then a man's hand. Later, the two sit at a bar having a drink, with Marionette turning and the bar now being a scene of death and chaos around them. What do you say we find this Joker? Images and nightmares are flashing through Rorschach's mind, though, while this is going on, and he sees the monster suddenly appearing before him in a bright light, and he sits up screaming. It's okay. You're safe. Bruce tells him by his bedside. I read the journal. I know where Dr. Manhattan is. Later, the truck rolls through the gates of the Arkham Asylum. Batman pulls Rorschach to his feet, telling him to follow his lead. He leads him down the dark corridors of the asylum, looking at his tracker. Down here, signal's getting stronger. They stop with Batman looking through a dark door. He's in here. Rorschach steps into the shadows of the cell, calling for Manhattan, but the door clanks shut behind him. No! Rorschach hisses as he turns back to Batman on the other side of the bars. I'm sorry, but you belong here. Rorschach rushes to the bar, screaming, Kill you for this! Cut out your eyes! Batman walks away, to screams echoing through the hallway around him. Let me out! The cook drops a pile of slop onto Reggie's plate. He stares straight ahead, barely noticing the world around him until the cook yells for him to move. The line of the cafeteria of Arkham shuffles forward and Reggie with it. Zebra Man brushes against him from behind, offering to protect him, promising to treat him very gently. I protect my property, he promises. Reggie looks into the man's eyes, his mind flashing back to his childhood, his own world. He's a boy sitting on the floor as the news discusses the dark turn the world is taking. His parents talk behind him, talking about the future, the world that they live in. His father is a therapist, waiting for his big break, waiting for his time to write a book. Now he's back in Arkham, the guards dragging him down the hallway, screaming, blood dripping from his mouth as he spits out a chunk of Zebraman's flesh onto the floor. Now he's back in college talking to his mother on the phone while the people protest the war and Dr. Manhattan's involvement behind them. Why didn't you tell me, Mom? He asks, having seen a report of his father beginning to work with the recently captured Rorschach. She tells him not to worry, that he's making some real headway with the costumed hero. They've even become friends, she tells him, but he doesn't like the tone of her voice. That night, Reggie packs a bag and he loads it into his car. With the threat of war, classes have been canceled and intends to visit his parents. He listens to the radio as he's stuck in traffic in the city, when suddenly there is a bright light and a buzzing noise fills his brain. His eyes go wide, and he begins to scream into that bright light. He's screaming in Arkham right now, in current day struggling to get free, but he stops as that door opens. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Matthew Mason, the therapist tells him with a smile as he enters the room. He begins to talk, asking Reggie his name mentioning that none of his DNA, fingerprints, or dental records match any database. Reggie stares as an eye opens on the man's forehead and the creature looks at him. He recoils back from the shock. Millions died in the attack of the creatures in his world. When Ozymandias opened up a portal into another universe and invited monsters to invade their world. Thousands survived, but their minds were broken and hospitals were overflowing. He was in his car. He was stuck in traffic. The firemen asked him to lean back on the glass, but Reggie can't hear them. And the glass shatters at that time, and the men pulled him free. But he was still screaming. He was still struggling. Reggie is now in the mental institution, fighting against the orderlies day after day. Driven mad by the sights that he had seen that day, and at night he screams that he could still see them. He could see them all. Until finally he breaks free, rushing through the building to the roof. That's when he stepped on the ledge and he screamed into the moonlight. He beat his head against the wall and he finally stopped and he turned and a man stands nearby, a sheet blowing around him in the night breeze. Hi, nice night, Fort. 
the old man says, not even looking over his shoulder. You're gonna jump too? Reggie asks, strangely calm now. Oh no, the old man says with a smile, looking over his shoulder. I can fly. He steps off the ledge, throwing the sheet away from his naked body. Reggie watches as the handmade moth-like wings unfurl from the man's back, and he stares, stunned as the man flaps away in the moonlight. Even when the orderlies finally appear and they wrestle him to the ground, Reggie is too stunned to fight back. Now, he's back in the hospital with the doctor holding up a Rorschach test, asking him what he sees. The image of his parents dead in front of him flashes in his mind, but finally, he calms down. A moth, he finally tells them. His days in the hospital pass slowly. Byron, the former Mothman, was returned and the two became friends. The world continues on the outside with Adrian Veidt working alongside the world leaders to rebuild their world, the one that he destroyed. But back in Arkham, Reggie has returned to his cell. He could hear a voice in his head calling his name. Years passed in his world and Reggie and Byron became good friends. Reggie was sick of being pushed around, rage filling up inside of him. He had no one to blame. The creature that had killed so many and left so many others broken mentally was dead. Byron taught him to fight to channel his anger. He fought back against the orderlies that pushed around the patients, striking out against their mistreatment. And finally, in October of 1992, the world learned the truth. Adrian Veidt was suspected of orchestrating the alien attack, of creating the creature that left Reggie's mind snapped and broken, and had killed his parents, and killed millions. Everything's changed. I have someone to blame, he thinks to himself, and that night he packs his meager belongings. But why? Byron asks him, standing by his bed in the dark. I stay and I get shipped off to a government psych center while the rest of the world gets their hands on fight. Reggie hisses. What if he didn't do it? Did it? Anyone can see it. Reggie answers angrily. And that night they set the laundry on fire and they sound the alarm with everyone rushing in. Reggie and Byron escape into the woods, the hospital burning down around them. But Byron stops, turning back to stare at the glow of the fire. Why are you stopping? Reggie asks his friend, and Byron finally looks over his shoulder. It's been calling me, he says, pulling off his jacket to reveal the moth wings again. He walks forward, ignoring Reggie's cries for his friend, and Reggie watches as Byron disappears into the flames, a moth drawn to the light. Later, Reggie would find the map that Byron had left him, the letter telling him where to find Adrian Veidt's secret lair, the mask once having belonged to Rorschach, and Reggie would push through the Arctic, his journey long and anguished. The last night of his journey, he drew out the mask, pulling it on over his head. He became Rorschach. He pushed onward in the blinding snow, finally entering the secret lair of the man who had killed his parents. He stepped through that building, crossing through the great chambers, passing rows of computer screens. And he entered a medical room with his prey sitting nearby, head in his hands. Rorschach moves slowly, drawing a scalpel from one of the trays and stalking forward. If you're here to kill me, I might thank you if you make it quick, whoever you are. Adrian turns, staring at the men. You're obviously not Kovacs, he tells him. As surprised as I am that you are dressed like him, I know why you're here. Because of what I did. The mistake that I made, Adrian tells him. Mistake? You killed my parents, Reggie tells him, beginning to slam his fist into the side of his own head. Screeching of creature, ruptured eardrums. A child's body burst open like a balloon full of spaghetti sauce. He roars in anger, lashing out, slamming Adrian against the wall. He presses the scalpel to the man's throat, drawing a bead of blood. Then do it! Make the world cheer at celebration! Rorschach! Adrian tells him, a tear forming in his eyes. I wanted the world to see a monster, but I am the monster. What have I done? He opens his eyes, staring into Rorschach's face. I'm sorry. I saw the light. The words make Reggie pause, and he thinks of Byron, and he drops Adrian Veidt. They both sink to the floor. Back in his cell at Arkham, in the current day, Reggie hears a voice. This time he looks up and he sees a blonde woman standing at his cell door. I'm Jane Doe. I've been in your mind for a few days and, whoa, what a busy place. We need to get you out of here before it's too late. I won't be around much longer. She smiles at him, light seeping through the door. She opens the cell and Reggie holds out his hand. Who are you? A friend. The doctors look at the man's x-ray showing no signs of any distress in Adrian's brain. This man was lucky. He fell 20 stories and all he ended up with was a fractured rib and a pulmonary contusion. Other than that, he's perfectly fine. The doctors leave the room, leaving only the police to stand outside. The drugs he was given should keep the man out for hours. But as the door closes, 
Adrian Veidt opens up his eyes. He sits up, gritting his teeth in pain, and he tries to move, but his hand is cuffed. Outside, the two officers react as quickly as they hear the beep of Adrian flatlining within. They rush inside, and they find the man lying quietly in bed. Forget it. You can downgrade the five alarm, one officer states, reaching for the fallen sensor. His sensors came loose, that's all. Yes, I pulled them loose to bring you back in here, Adrian tells him, his voice startling them as he holds up the unlocked handcuffs. So I could get the keys to my cuff. Now please, sir, take off your uniform. The officers reach for their guns, anger flashing in their eyes, and moments later, Adrian enters the parking garage dressed in the officer's uniform with his gun pressed into the back of his partner. They come up behind several other officers and an animal control worker who wonders at the sight of Abastus. My uniform and my cat. He tells him, pointing his weapon at their backs. I'd like them both back. Minutes later, Babastis meows as Adrian points the van out of the parking garage and rumbles down the road. Elsewhere in the city, Rorschach and his new friend have broken into a used clothing store. I can't wear real leather. It's outlawed where I come from, Jane Doe yells. Where do you come from? Rorschach asks, pulling his belongings from Arkham's evidence bag. Never mind, it's fake, she says, ignoring him and pulling on her jacket. Don't even know your name. Not important. But you can call me Saturn Girl. Saturn reaches into her own bag, pulling free a gold ring with an L and a star engraved on it. Need to find Manhattan, Rorschach tells her as the two step into the night air. Any ideas? Oh yes, we need to find a great light, Saturn Girl tells him. Meanwhile, over in a retirement home, the orderlies open up the door to Johnny Thunder's room. But the old man is gone. A Nathaniel Dusk movie plays in the background as the men investigate the sheets that were tied to the bedpost to allow the elderly man to climb out the window. A newspaper laying next to the bed tells of a mysterious green fire that spread within an old steel mill. Across town, Mr. Thunder stares out the bus window into the rainy night as he heads towards Pittsburgh. And back at the crash site of Night Owl's old ship, Adrian slides open the door, holding Babastus in his hands. Yes, they're gone, he answers. He notes, answering his pet's inquisitive meow. You must be Adrian Veidt. A voice calls in the shadows and Adrian turns to find Batman sitting in the pilot's seat with Rorschach's journal in his hands. I've read all about you, he tells him, holding up the leather-bound journal. Lights flash outside and Batman stares out the viewport, seeing the police cruisers grow closer. What do you want with my world? He asks. I don't want any trouble, but it seems that's all you have to offer, Adrian notes, taking his seat at the aircraft controls. We know you're in there. Come out with your hands over your head. The police call over their loudspeakers, lights still flashing in the dark. The officers fall back though as the airship rises into the sky. The ship floats through the night sky as Batman watches out the viewport. Rorschach escaped, he tells Adrian, turning back to him. Of course he did, but we have more immediate concerns. Beneath them, the streets of Gotham team with people, riders protesting the exploits of Batman, and they look up seeing the ship above, and they shake their signs at it. It stops now, Batman tells Adrian, gritting his teeth, but Vite smiles, and Batman thinks that he is responsible for the troubles that have overtaken his city, his world. I've read and seen enough to know that you are tripping over your own capes, playing a game of tag while the world falls apart around you, Vite tells the Dark Knight. Meanwhile, over in Pittsburgh, a bus finally pulls to a stop and Johnny Thunder steps off, standing before the all-American steel mill, rain falling on his bald head. He ignores the no trespassing signs and he makes his way inside and out of the rain. They must have tried to melt it down with the rest of the scrap, he notes, staring at the pipes that have burst apart as it torn through with incredible energy. He turns, voices echoing in the building behind him, and three drug addicts see him stopping short. Hey, security? Nah. Maybe he got something. One notes as the three move towards him. They reach out their two skinny arms, their rotting teeth and stale breath blowing into Johnny's face. Give me what you got, they snarl. Give me a wallet or I'll poke your eyes out. Johnny pushes them away, trying to run, but the thugs just laugh. We'll give you a five second head start, old man. Over in Gotham, Adrian continues to evade the police choppers while berating Batman on his colleague's failure to fix the world that they were given. You're too busy putting these supervillains into prisons with revolving doors. You've ignored the world's real problems, he tells him. And Batman reaches for him, trying to stop him, but the aircraft smashes into the side of a building, throwing the Dark Knight to the floor. Outside, the riots have continued. Mime and Marionette stepping out onto the GCPD rooftop, where some thugs are throwing the bat signal into the street below. Isn't this lively? I hope they have fireworks, Marionette laughs. Adrian pulls up, Batman tumbling back, rolling across the floor. What have you tried to do to make your world a better place? 
Adrian asks, rolling the craft. Batman tumbles again, this time falling out the open hatch. He plummets towards the streets of Gotham and the angry crowd below. Reaching for his grappling gun, he fires it. He swings on the tethered line and the crowd reaches for him, trying to pull him down. Fists and feet begin to pummel him, blood spurting from his nose. Meanwhile, at the steel mill, Johnny rounds the corner, the crowing cackles of thugs echoing behind him, and he stops short, his eyes falling at the sight of the green lantern sitting before him. I found it, he cries triumphantly as he picks it up, but it's ripped from his hands and fists begin to rain blows on his aging face. The green light fills the ground as he's knocked to the floor. One of the addicts raises the lantern, prepared to bring it down on Thunder's face, but a club comes out cracking hard against the man's bone, snapping it. He falls away screaming as Rorschach steps forward, launching into a fight with the remaining addicts. Mr. Thunder? Saturn Girl asks, reaching to comfort the old man. Don't worry about them, she tells him, pulling his head away. They were going to die of an overdose tonight anyway. Meanwhile, over in Gotham, Marionette looks down into the crowd below, which have begun to crawl over the destroyed bat signal. This is fun! <laughs> she laughs. You two have caused me a little trouble tonight. A voice calls from behind them, and the villains turn to see the Joker walking across the rooftop, a smile on his face. Hey, boss! One of the goons calls. I'm monologuing! <laughs> Turning with anger, he stops, looking down at the beaten body of Batman before him. At the steel mill, Rorschach turns away from the beaten bodies of the addicts on the ground, and he reaches for the Green Lantern. He turns back to Johnny Thunder, holding it aloft. Tell us, what is Lantern? On her world, a young Erica Manson sits hiding beneath the counter in her father's puppet store. Tell us where the doll is, old man! Someone shouts. Her father is knocked to the floor in front of her, and Erica cries out tears in her eyes. In the present day, Marionette and Mime are walking down a sewer tunnel their hands held up by the Joker's goons who are pointing guns at their backs. I can't have you and Cat got his tongue cartwheeling around the town slaughtering men like pigs. <laughs> Pushing the broken Batman in a wheelchair before him. It makes me look bad. Our mistake won't happen again, Marionette tells him with a smile. The Joker smiles wider, telling her, I would usually carve off your face, but I'm not in the mood. The bat at last is mine. <laughs> they suddenly stop seeing three of Mr. Freeze's goons lost in the tunnels ahead. The men seem scared as the Joker and his crew grow ever closer. The men seem lost and the Joker smiles wide. I have a proposition for you lost souls. Ditch the Parkers and join the Joker. The men look at each other for a moment. These are kind of hot. One huffs, pulling off his hood. Shanky, where are you, pumpkin? Joker calls, and from behind the rest comes a small man covered in tattoos. In his shaking hand, he holds up a tattoo gun. Ready to welcome our new guest to the circle. <laughs> he stutters. Marionette watches as her thoughts race back to her childhood when she was a little girl in her father's shop when she first met Marcos Mies, whose family owned the store across the street. She saw him through the window and put on a puppet show for him. When she looked again, that boy was gone. She turned, startled to find the quiet boy standing next to her in the shop. Uh, hi, my name's Erica. Who are you? But Marcos remains silent, staring around at the hundreds of puppets that dangle off the walls. I know, the shop leaves a lot of people speechless for the first time when they see it. She smiles, tugging at the boy's arm, and she begins to lead him away, showing him around. Back in the tunnels, though, Mime and Marionette look on as Shaky begins to tattoo the new recruits, bringing screams of pain. And the Joker smiles, looking back at them over his shoulder. All right, I'm in a generous mood. Apology accepted, you two. <laughs> Which one of you wants to go next? Marionette shakes her head, clapping her hands together, pulling free her wire. Tattooed by Mr. Jitters over there? Pass, she snarls, and moving fast, she severs the gun of the closest goon. Hey, Mime, let's teach them how to wink, she smiles, and Mime nods, jamming his finger into another's eye sockets, bringing screams of pain and spouts of blood. Oh no, don't lose your head, boys, Joker calls, pulling free a pistol. That's why they call you the Joker? That one was a bit on the nose. 
Joker aims his pistol at the man that Mime is beating and fires. The round cuts through the head of the Joker's thug, dropping him to the floor. Oh, well, that's embarrassing. Everyone stares in shock, but the Joker just smiles, turning back to Batman, pushing him down the tunnel. Well played, he calls over his shoulder. Come now, everyone. We wouldn't want to be later than we already are. Back in her world, in an earlier time, young Erica was walking down the street with her marionette puppet when she was stopped by the neighborhood kids. Why are you always smiling? It creeps everyone out, like your dad does. What kind of creepy old man plays with dolls? They tell her. The kids take the doll from her, throwing her to the ground and hitting her. They call her dad a pedophile. Suddenly, glass bottles sail out of the air, cracking hard against the kids' heads, drawing blood. Marco stands by, ready with another bottle. And the ringleader tries to run away, but Erica chases her down, tackling her and making her apologize. Erica turns back to Marco with a smile on her face. Do you have another bottle? She asks. But back in the tunnels, the Joker pulls aside a curtain, revealing a large chamber before them. He motions with his arms to the gathering of supervillains in the room. All this talk of the Superman theory has gotten everyone's tights in a bunch. They're huddled up as the Legion of Evil or Secret Society of Doom or whatever name they've landed on this time. He tells them, pushing Batman forward. Isn't this world wonderful? There are so many of them. A marionette sighs, looking at all of the villains. Let's wheel Batsy down there and surprise them, he whispers with glee. Within the room, the Riddler stands atop one of the old subway cars, trying to convince the group that they need to come together, that they need to find the traitors that are within their midst, such as the government-made supervillain Typhoon. But he stops short as he is interrupted. Oh no, not him. Ladies and gentlemen, the Joker calls, entering the room with Mime and Marionette flanking him. I interrupt this repetitive affair to introduce my new friends, Marionette and... Who are you again? He suddenly asks, and then he pushes Batman forward with Two-Face calling out from the back. Who's the Batman? I mean, this time. How many fools have you dressed up like Batman and peddled around here, Joker? A few, I admit. The Riddler tries to get the meeting back on track, but some of the villains move forward, wanting to get the possible traitor out of the room. Typhoon suddenly powers up, knocking Penguin away, and he turns to the group, anger in his voice. I will kill all of... But his words are interrupted as his head suddenly explodes with the impact of a bullet. And chaos erupts into the chamber as the villains begin to run in every direction. I see smoke! <laughs> the Joker smiles, looking into the dark corner of the room. And in those shadows, the comedian looks down the sight of his rifle again, aiming for Marionette's head. But the woman dodges and one of the court of the owls drops to the floor instead. Mime leaps up onto the subway car and Blake takes aim. That's right, you crazy son of a bitch. Say cheese. But his sight is blocked as Giganta suddenly appears before him, swinging her massive fist, forcing him to jump away. He lands amongst the villains who then begin to crowd around him. Here we go, he sighs, pulling out his 45. And he begins to fire, nicking the villains and forcing them to scatter. Riddler yells for him to stop, but a round destroys his kneecap, forcing him to the ground. And Mime and Marionette run as a grenade explodes behind them. What a perfect day this turned out to be! Joker smiles, staring at all of the destruction before him, and Mime begins to slow, wanting to draw the comedian's attention. You're not gonna draw his fire! Marionette yells at him. That's the damn comedian! It sure is! Blake yells, stalking towards them through the smoke. Meanwhile, in a previous time, in her father's workshop, Erica hides under the counter as her father is beaten. She calls to him when he's hit to the ground, but the men discover her, dirty cops, and they drag her free and threaten her so that her father gives up the protection money that he owes. Afterwards, her father clutches her as they both bawl in tears. The next day, Erica entered the shop after school and she found her father had hung himself in the back room. And looking down, she discovered the note that he left. It told her to take the money in the register and run. The bell over the door chimes and the dirty cops enter startled to find the young girl and her dead father. She snarls, grabbing her father's scissors and she rushed at the two men. She stabbed the sharp metal under the first one's neck, drawing great spurts of blood that brought him to his knees. And the other cop pulls her off, throwing her heart against a wall. He pulled his gun, but Marcos comes out of the shadows, biting onto the man's wrist, throwing him. I'll snap your neck. He snarls, but Erica is behind him now, strangling him with puppet wire. That man died, foaming at the mouth. And meanwhile, back in Gotham, 
The two villains have hidden in a motel. Marionette yelling at Mime, not wanting him to go out to draw the comedian's attention. You're not going to leave me to die so that I can run, she tells him. Memories of their lives flashing before her eyes. Of them living on the streets, of them fighting to stay alive, of them falling in love, becoming villains. Her giving birth to their son while in prison. And later the two lay in each other's arms in bed. The thing about you freaks is you don't cover your tracks very well. Blake tells them stepping out of the shadows in their room, pistol aimed at the pair. I only need one of you to tell me where Ozymandias is. Which is it going to be? He smiles. Suddenly his face goes rigid and he falls to the floor, revealing the Joker standing in the open doorway behind him, his joy buzzer still smoking. He reaches down, pulling free the smiley face button and he clips it onto his jacket. I like you two. You make me laugh. <laughs> Marionette stands, looking down at Edward Blake. I was just thinking. I bet the comedian knows where Dr. Manhattan is. Dr. Dr. Manhattan? Who's that? I could use a good dentist. <laughs> it hurts when I smile. The rain pours down as Rorschach, Saturn Girl, and Johnny Thunder stand under a bus stop overhang. The Green Lantern glowing in Rorschach's hands as he turns to the old man. He's, he's my best friend. I've, I've been looking for him for a long time. Johnny smiles, looking at the lantern. You have a magic genie? Rorschach asks, looking at the lantern in his hand. Genie's a lantern? Like Aladdin? Saturn Girl looks at the masked hero, a smile on her face. Don't sound so skeptical. The light will help you find Dr. Manhattan, she tells him. Suddenly, the three are bathed in light, with Rorschach looking up at the searchlight of Night Owl's ship glaring down at them. <clears throat> he mutters. And inside, Thunder looks around in wonder as Rorschach begins to talk to Adrian Veet. Not that I don't mind meeting new and interesting people, Rorschach, but who are they? My name is Imra Ardeen. I'm designated as Saturn Girl. I'm a telepath from the 30th century, she tells him with a flash of a smile. Didn't mention that last part when we met. Rorschach tells Adrian with a pause. Where did you find her? Arkham Asylum. Of course you did. Adrian sighs. And the news begins to play on the screen behind them, showing the world its distrust of the superheroes. An image of Superman saving children in Benghazi runs next, and the newscaster explains that despite all, the world has maintained trust in the Man of Steel. Superman's why I serve the Legion of Superheroes, sent here to cleanse the time stream of the unknown anomaly that threatens him, Saturn Girl tells them, placing her hand against the screen. Reconsidering my suggestion of bringing them with us, Rorschach nods. I would imagine, Adrian agrees. He suddenly lurches forward, clutching his head, but Rorschach places his hand on his back, asking him, How long you have? Maybe none at all, Adrian tells him, and Babastus begins to meow, his eyes and mouth glowing blue. What's Cat doing? Rorschach asks. Adrian explains that Babastus is linked to John and is getting his scent from both the Lantern and the two others on the ship. When it comes to Dr. Manhattan, there are no coincidences, Adrian tells his partner. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Gotham, Do I see a smile? Joker asks. Because if I don't see a smile, I can make one. Edward Blake looks up at the strange clown now in front of him, struggling to ask where he is. The Joker's funhouse hideout surrounds them with all of its flashing lights and bright paint. The clown prince of crime comes forward, pinching the man's cheeks. You've caused quite a stir with my brethren, but I will give you five stars for that shot to Edward Nigma. <laughs> What's green, red, and missing a kneecap? Behind them, Marionette is admiring the Joker's wall of weapons and power tools. Don't be shy! My home is your home! He calls out, and the woman takes hold of a power drill, stepping forward to the restrained comedian. She leans forward, demanding to know how the comedian arrived in this world. How he didn't die. Why don't you uncuff me and I'll show you, sweetheart. The drill is driven into his arm, spouting blood and screams. Tell us where Dr. Manhattan is and I'll only drill into your arm. Who knows where and when that asshole is? Blake spits. All Doc asked me to do was take Veet's cat, okay? I was just having a bit of fun with the two of you. Marionette brings the drill close to the man's arm again, but she is interrupted when mine taps her, making an image of bat ears with his fingers. The two look over to see that Darknet has freed himself and is stalking across the room. He throws a smoke bomb and the two villains leap at him, but he barely ducks underneath Marionette's garriott as it shears off one of the ears on his cow. The kick sends her across the room, though, with Mime firing his invisible gun. The round cracks a window instead, though. I didn't see that coming! <laughs> outside, though, the Night Owl's ship is hovering outside of a building. Adrian prepares to step out, telling Thunder and Saturn that they should wait behind. 
He takes the lantern from them, basking in its glow. Inside, Batman tosses Mime away, throwing his hands up in time to stop Marionette's wire from cutting off his head. He screams in pain and anger, though, as the wire cuts into his wrist. A burst of flames erupt from the other side of the room as Joker places a flamethrower between his legs. Is that a flamethrower in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> Come on, somebody laugh! No time for laughing. Rorschach grumbles behind him, and on the other side of the room, Batman steps through the smoke, brushing the flames off of his cape. Rorschach, I was wrong about you. He growls, and Adrian agrees, stepping into the room. He greets Blake and Babastus meows as his eyes glow blue. What the hell is so special about that cat? Blake asks from his chair, and the cat begins to glow brighter and brighter, and energy begins to crackle between the cat and the lantern. Babastus sees John's temporal fingerprint on this lantern and you, Edward. As she feeds, John should feel a strong pull to her. To deny it would prove painful. The energy begins to shoot out around the room, with Adrian crying out, John, I demand that you show yourself! Suddenly, the energy stops, and Dr. Manhattan stands in the center of the room. Hello, John. I know who you are. Batman growls, and Joker throws up his hand, shielding his eyes from the naked Dr. Manhattan. Whoever you are, put clothes on, for God's sake! Or at least for mine! John doesn't do anything, though. Instead, he seemingly traces a circle around himself and the others from his world. What, what is he doing, Feet? Rorschach asks, and Adrian steps forward, still holding his cat. I'm sorry for summoning you here like that, John, but we need to talk. Batman and the Joker shield their eyes as the room is filled with a bright flash of blue light. The group of strangers is suddenly gone. The circle on the floor appears, floating over a waterfall in a deep jungle. So let's talk. John tells him. Adrian stands before John, asking him to return to their world to save it. You've come a long way for nothing, Adrian. I'm not going back, he tells him. John tells him that he is in the middle of something, that he knows that Adrian brought Marionette and Mime here to try and appeal to his humanity. You believe that I was hesitant to use extreme force when I learned that Erica Manson was pregnant, he says, turning to look at the woman, but I did not spare you because you were pregnant. I saw what your child would do, and I chose to save him, John tells her. Marionette crosses the small space, angry, demanding to know where her child is. What will he do? What child? John asks, stunning her. You're pregnant again. The two villains look at each other before pulling one another into a tight embrace. You will not change my mind, Adrian. I'm disappointed in you. I was. I am. I will be. He tells the men, and Rorschach steps forward, trying to convince John. Adrian has changed. Dying from cancer. John pauses, glancing at Veet. Adrian does not have cancer. Rorschach doesn't understand, and Adrian tries to calm him, but Reggie grabs the man. You tell him the truth, Adrian, because you know I will, John explains, reaching out for the butterfly that is floating by him. Adrian looks at Rorschach, explaining that he lied to him because he needed him. Reggie, you see what I want you to see. You saw a man that wanted to fix the things that he broke. You were the mask of the man you believed to be your father's friend. In reality, Rorschach broke your father. Your parents didn't die in each other's arms. They were separated because your mother was so unhappy. No, no! Rorschach snarls, his hands tightening around Adrian's throat. Is it true? Rorschach demands, the world shifting around them and their small space is now floating over the rioting crowds that are filling the streets of Washington, D.C. It is, Manhattan tells him. And Adrian struggles to ask John why he came to this world, and John explains. At first, I thought I would live among them. I saw a vision of them most hopeful. I was hopeless, but then I saw nothing. The world flashes again, and now they are floating above a movie screen showing a Nathaniel Dusk movie. John looks at the actors explaining, I once knew the man named Carver Coleman. What does that have to do with anything? Adrian asks, but John holds up his hand. We've talked enough. The world flashes again, and they are now back at the Joker's hideout, but Dr. Manhattan is no longer with them. Adrian reaches down for Babastis, hoping to get John back, but Rorschach lashes out, kicking him in the face. He falls, and the vigilante falls on top of him, raining blows on him. The Joker laughs, shocking Batman with his buzzer, and he reaches up for Rorschach, offering some constructive criticism. But Rorschach turns, throwing the clown to the ground, beginning to beat on him. The Joker is laughing, reaching up, tracing a bloody smile onto Rorschach's mask. And he looks up to find that Mime, Marionette, and Adrian are all gone. 
Outside, Saturn Girl and Johnny Thunder look up as the hatch door opens up, revealing a broken and bloodied agent. He pulls himself inside, and when the two try to help, he knocks Saturn Girl aside and throws Thunder back with a strong kick, and he struggles to the pilot's seat. John refuses to call, he stutters. But with the knowledge that I have, Babastus, I realize I can save more than our worlds. I can save this one too. I can save everything and everyone. I have a plan. John appears on Mars, stepping off the small circle of the floor that he has brought from the hideout. Visions of an angry Superman coming at him flash in his mind as he begins to walk across the barren landscape. A picture drifts along the dusty ground. Does Superman destroy me or do I destroy everything? Busbastus yawns, his mouth stretching wide, as he sits on the floor of the Oval Office, the seal of the President of the United States beneath him. Behind him, bathed in moonlight that floods through the windows, Adrian Veet holds up the file that he was looking for. Yes, yes, this one will do nicely, he whispers to himself. Back at the Daily Planet, Lois and Clark stand talking to Perry White as he leans out of his office, yelling for Lois to finish a story that she owes him. I'm working on it, Chief, she promises. And when she turns back to her desk, she finds an envelope addressed to her with no return. She reaches forward, curiosity overcoming her. Breaking news from Moscow! The news suddenly blares behind her, bringing everyone's attention to the TV. And Clark comes over, putting his arm around his wife as they watch the events unfolding. The reporters confirm that the nuclear hero known as Firestorm has invaded Russia when the country began to round up citizens that they believed had a metagene. Speculation that he is connected to the Superman theory continues, although Firestorm has intensely denied the accusations. The reporter states and Lois looks at her husband, questioning him. Firestorm wasn't created by some secret government program, Lois, Clark tells her. Ronnie Raymond and Martin Stein were in a nuclear accident that fused them together. Ronnie is in control of the body while the professor advises him telepathically. Ronnie is just a kid known for his temper. The news continues to show the fight as Perry leans out of his office again, screaming who wants to go to Russia, and both Lois and Clark raise their hands. Meanwhile, over in Moscow, Firestorm and Pazar trade their blasts of fiery energy with Pazar's teammates lashing out, eventually bringing the nuclear hero to the ground. With his fire extinguished, Firestorm drops into the Russian crowd below, hands reaching for him as the crowd lashes out. And Ronnie begins to scream, let go of me! His fire ignites, it begins to blast over the crowd. And when the flames recede, Ronnie stands, looking out at the crowd of people that have turned to glass around him. He stares, fear and sorrow on his face. My, my God, uh, what did I do? I, I didn't mean to. He disappears into the air, disappearing into a blaze of fire. But back at the bugle, the reporters all stare at the news report. Did, did he kill those people? Jimmy asks, stunned. It can't be what it looks like. Can it, Clark? Lois asks, and when she looks back behind her, Clark is gone in a gust of wind. And with a whoosh, everyone sees Superman streak past the window headed out of the country. But Superman doesn't head to Moscow. And in the capital of Kondok, the hero known as the Creeper looks up from handing a child an apple. A bird, a plane, a Superman. He chuckles as the Man of Steel lands nearby, offering him a wave. Superman looks up as Giganta steps up to him, and the two nod at each other, with the supervillain leading the Man of Steel to their leader's throne. Hello, Superman! Black Adam calls, sitting on his throne, leaning on his arm. He stands, stalking across the room to stand before Superman. A moment passes and the ruler extends his arm, offering it. Welcome to Kondok. The two shake their hands with Black Adam leading Superman around the castle, showing him that the metahumans and the humans both live there peacefully, hero and villain alike. And Gondok, all are welcome, Black Adam tells him. Even Firestorm? That is why you're here, is it not? But Black Adam tells him that Firestorm has not come to Gondok, despite what the rumors state. And the two share a conversation, where Superman tells Adam to make sure that he doesn't try to cross any borders to take the law into his own hands. When you find Firestorm, tell him that he's welcome in Kondok. Black Adam tells him, and with their conversation complete, Superman turns and flies away. But later, Lois sits at her desk at the planet, talking to Clark on the phone. The two believe that Ronnie never left Russia, and Clark hangs up. With Lois telling him to be careful, she turns once again, noticing the envelope with her name on it, and she reaches inside to discover 
a flash drive. Who sent me this? She asks, plugging it into the computer. Company presents American News. The loud voice narrates as a World War II newsreel begins to play. It's April 2nd, 1941. As the war rages overseas, back home there's trouble. Saboteurs, spies, fascists, the voice calls out. Lois leads forward, trying to figure out what this is. Images of teams of superheroes flash across the screen. And only the Justice Society of America can stop them. Lois leans closer, not recognizing any of those superheroes. Who the hell is the Justice Society of America? She questions. Meanwhile, Superman lands in the dark city of Chernobyl. He stops, listening closely, hearing the voice of Firestorm coming out of one of the abandoned buildings. Inside, he finds Firestorm lashing out with his atomic energies. Come on, please! He cries as Superman steps into the room, seeing one of the small children that Ronnie turned to glass. You have to show me how to do it, Professor! Tell me how to do it! Ronnie pleads, falling to his knees. Superman comes up behind the young man, trying not to startle him. What happened, Ronnie? He asks softly. He puts his hand on the man's shoulder, assuring him that he doesn't want a fight. I'm not here to hurt you. What happened to those people? He asks, nodding towards the glass child. Tears fill Ronnie's eyes as he explains that he's only ever been able to transform elements, nothing organic. You're trying to bring the boy back. Superman nods, and Ronnie follows up, nodding with him, telling him the Stein doesn't think it's possible. You did it once, Ronnie. Maybe it was an accident or a trigger through stress. Maybe your powers are evolving. I don't know, but you did it. You can do it again. Ronnie nods, promising to try again. He warns Superman that he should leave, that he might detonate if he's unstable, and Superman smiles, putting his hand on the man's shoulder as he moves to step behind him. I'm not leaving. I'll be fine, Ronnie. Ronnie nods preparing himself, and he blasts out, hitting the glass child with all of his energy. He pours it on with a blast he's thrown backwards, smoking. And the room clears, and the small child looks up at them, and Superman smiles at him. Superman? Privat. The Man of Steel greets him, waving. We did it! Firestorm cheers from the floor, smiling and crying. Superman picks up the boy, assuring Firestorm that he is okay. Everyone else in Moscow will be as well. It's going to be all right, Ronnie, he assures him. Tears fill the young man's eyes. Thank you, Superman, he smiles. Near the site of the incident in Russia, Vladimir Putin has called together a press conference. He confirms that Firestorm's act of aggression against the Russian people is seen as an act of war by an American agent, says the man is known to be part of the Superman theory. We are at war, Putin confirms. I was hoping I could convince you otherwise, sir. Superman calls, descending from above. Welcome, Superman. Thank you for coming. I assume you were here to help. Putin greets him. Superman confirms that he is, and he steps onto the podium. As Superman addresses the crowd, he asks that they try not to demonize the metahuman population, and that the Superman theory is nothing more than a giant lie. On his way to Moscow, Batman is listening to the broadcast, and he flicks a switch, sending a signal that only Clark can hear. Clark, it's Bruce. You need to stop talking. Keep your mouth shut. Don't pick a side. Back on stage, Putin steps forward, demanding that Superman stop. I have proof. Firestorm is an American agent, Superman. This was an attack against the people of Russia, he tells the Man of Steel. But Superman tries to explain that Firestorm could change the people back. But he's interrupted as Ronnie suddenly lands amongst the people. Everyone begins to scatter in fear as the military moves in, and no one notices the young boy in Firestorm's arms as the soldiers aim their weapons. Superman moves fast, suddenly appearing in front of the boy, blocking the bullets. The rounds ricochet, shattering the people that have turned to glass. No, you're killing them! Ronnie screams, lashing out against the soldiers with his energy. The heroes leap in with Pozar attacking Firestorm. The rest of his team move in on Superman, trying to stop him. Please, I can make this right! Firestorm begs as he struggles with the Pozar. The tanks begin to rumble in, rolling over the glass statues. As Superman sees this, anger filling him, and he throws the other heroes off of him. He flashes forward, throwing his shoulder into the tank, knocking it backwards. Firestorm falls amongst the destroyed statues. Tears are in his eyes. No, no, I can fix this! He cries as he holds up the pieces of the statue that was once human. Why wouldn't you listen? He screams, his nuclear fire flaring. Superman moves forward, reaching a hand out to the young hero when he hears Bruce's voice in his ears again. 
Superman, listen to me. The energy readings are spiking. Don't lose control, Ronnie, Superman tells the young man, putting his hand on his shoulder. Ronnie closes his eyes. And the energy dissipates. I'm, I, I'm okay, he breathes. Superman suddenly pauses as he hears Bruce's voice in his ear. He is screaming, it's not Firestorm. The blue light flashes around them, destroying everything. The blast hits the bat wing, shattering the cockpit. And from his command center, Adrian Veet is watching the events unfold on the news. And he smiles. It begins. A gold ring floats through space, droplets of blood sticking to the cold vacuum. In the future, Dr. Manhattan sees a young legionnaire give his life to save the Earth's sun. The explosion sends the ring back and Manhattan looks at it in his hands. Something is wrong though. Time is fluid. Manhattan cocks his head to the side. It is July 1940 and he moves the Green Lantern six inches away from Alan Scott, seconds before his accident. He looks down at the ring in his hand, but it is gone. It was never there. He looks again into the future and sees nothing but darkness. One week from now, he sees nothing. The last image he sees is of Superman angrily charging at him. Does Superman destroy me or do I destroy everything? He asks himself. Several ships draw closer as the entirety of the Justice League and their allies close in on Mars. It is here that they have tracked the energy signature that caused the destruction of Moscow. John looks up into space from the surface of Mars. Five days ago, a tachyon fog on Earth obscured his vision to see into the past and the future. The fog has begun to fade and John can once again see into the past. He sees the destruction of Moscow. The heroes gathering, Batman and Superman. He sees the Earth turning against the Man of Steel, gathering outside the Hall of Justice to protest his involvement in Russia. Inside, Lois runs to her husband, who still lays unconscious from the blast. At Wayne Manor, Alfred turns to find Bruce coming and struggling up from his bed despite his wounds. What's going on? Where's Clark? Alfred tries to push the man back to his bed to no avail. He's recovering, secured in the Hall of Justice, Alfred assures him, and Firestorm. The young man awakens on one of the Justice League ships, startled to find Professor Stein sitting next to him. In the manor, though, Bruce is stalking through the house, headed for the Batcave while Alfred explains why the entire League left the planet to travel to Mars. They discovered that it wasn't Firestorm who caused the explosion. It was someone else. Someone that they believe is trying to kill Superman. Bruce rips off the last of his bandages as he sits at his computer. They're being played. Firestorm wasn't behind the explosions, but I don't know if the man that they're going after was either. I should have listened. I didn't see it. He whispers, looking at the mask of Rorschach. On Mars, the ships begin to land and the heroes gather staring out into the wasteland of Mars, seeing a palace in the distance. Kinda creepy, isn't it? Guy Gardner notes. So still, so pretty. Back on Earth, Lois stands over her recovering husband when suddenly a voice calls out in the darkened room. Hello, Lois. Did you get the drive that I sent you? Lex Luthor asks from the doorway. Lois turns, anger flashing in her eyes as she shouts at Lex. I don't know how you got here, Lex, but if you've come to finish Superman off, it'll be over my dead body. I have no intention of harming Superman at this moment, Lex assures her, stepping into the room. Meanwhile, back on Mars, the lanterns have sealed the planet in a green orb, and the heroes move forward, with Martian Manhunter taking lead. Hello, my name is Jean Jans. Who are you? Where do you come from? What are you doing on Mars? He asks as the heroes begin to encircle Dr. Manhattan, who barely seems to notice them. They're protesting a power that they fear, Dr. Manhattan states, still not looking at any of the heroes. A moment passes and he finally turns to Martian Manhunter. Excuse me, I was talking to Robbie Raymond six minutes from now. The tachyons are muddling up things. You're here looking for answers you don't know the questions to. Guy Gardner steps forward, looking around at the gathering of heroes. Shocker, the guy's a lunatic. But Jean tells him to stop. He tries to once again speak to Dr. Manhattan. Dr. Manhattan turns back to the Martian. From your mind, I can see that you're confused. Dr. Manhattan turns back to Martian Manhunter. Only for the moment, in five seconds, he will broadcast to everyone's thoughts that you read most clearly my final vision of Superman. The image flashes in everyone's mind and Supergirl is overcome with anger. You think that he's going to destroy you, so you're coming out to destroy him first? She demands. Guy steps forward, leaping into the air, his ring flashing. That's enough! Talk is over! Let's put some underwear on this guy. 
The energy strengthens his punch and the blow nearly twists Dr. Manhattan's head all around. A dull crack echoing throughout the fields of Mars as the man falls to the ground. Christ, I didn't mean to kill him outright. Guy starts to explain a smile on his face, but he's interrupted as Dr. Manhattan suddenly disappears. Where'd he go? Guy asks, looking around, but suddenly a voice speaks from over his shoulder. That ring, I'm curious, what's inside it? Dr. Manhattan, now completely healed, asks as he reaches out, his touch sending sparks of energy and pain through Guy Gardner's body. He pulls the ring from Guy's finger, dropping the now powerless man to the ground. I must admit, not knowing what is and was and will be, it's enjoyable. Dr. Manhattan notices as he holds up the energy ring. The ring shatters in his hand, drifting into the air in a haze of green smoke and sparkles. This energy, emotion, coalesced, manufactured in a power by the ring. He stares at the remnants of the Green Lantern energy. I find it difficult to affect. John Constantine orders the magic users to attack, and Etrogen leaps in, breathing fire, while Zatanna attacks with a blast of magical energy. Magic is swirling around Dr. Manhattan. You all believe that you are wielding magic. He holds out his hand, and the energy condenses into a ball. I see this power that you harness is really the scraps of creation, like random errors in computer code discarded and forgotten, left to be picked up and used by those who have also been discarded and forgotten. The heroes begin to move in for the attack, but the ball of magic expands rapidly, throwing them all away. It feels good to still learn. Dr. Manhattan smiles. Back at the Hall of Justice, Lex steps forward, telling Lois that he comes in peace, but Lois knows that Lex has spent his life trying to destroy the Man of Steel. Why would I believe a word that you say? Lex just smiles. He's excited to see Superman taken down a peg, and he understands her caution. Reaching into his pocket, he pulls out a pistol, offering it to her. Take it if it makes things better. Lois nods, taking the weapon, aiming it at Lex, gritting her teeth. Don't take a step closer to Superman, she warns. Lex just nods. I was the one who sent you the footage of those heroes that never were. It's proof, Lois. Proof that there is a force out there that is undermining not only Superman, but all of creation. On Mars, our heroes have pressed their attack, lightning crackling along the Marvel family, throwing them to the ground. Starfire leaps in, but her energy blasts are turned aside. The Doom Patrol is thrown as if they mean nothing. Firestorm sails past, aiming his power towards Dr. Manhattan. We can't hold back, Professor. We don't know what we're dealing with. He shouts, but Dr. Manhattan looks up, nodding and extending his finger. No, Ronald, you don't. In a flash of blue energy, Firestorm is once again in the lab where the accident that gave him powers took place. Dr. Manhattan stands by the window looking out on those who are protesting the experiment. They're protesting the power that they fear, he tells Robbie. And Robbie stands there not knowing what is happening. He asks where is Professor Stein and Dr. Manhattan merely points at the door. Robbie steps forward leaning and discovering Stein on the phone. His eyes widen in shock as he overhears Stein discussing the accident, how he believes that it's going to fuse them together. What better way to learn more about these metahumans than from the inside? Dr. Manhattan asks, and Robbie steps back shocked. Back on Mars, Firestorm flails in the air, lashing out in anger at Dr. Manhattan, the nuclear energy knocking them to the ground. The other heroes see this and they begin to press their attacks. Energy attacks from the heroes begin to drive Dr. Manhattan to his knees until finally he turns his head, seeing Captain Adam stepping forward. Get clear, he orders the other heroes. Forget Superman. Captain Adam is the last thing you're ever going to see. He shouts, hitting Manhattan with everything he has. Energy begins to rip out of Dr. Manhattan as a look of shock comes over his face. He explodes, sending the heroes flying as his palace is torn apart. Slowly, the smoke of destruction begins to clear, and the heroes pull themselves to their feet, with Dr. Manhattan seemingly defeated. They turn, though, as a soft blue light begins to glow. Veins and tendons begin to appear and are quickly covered as muscles and skin grow over them. And in mere moments, Dr. Manhattan stands before them once again. What were you hoping to accomplish? He asks, his blue light beginning to expand, filling the space all around them until they disappear at a harsh light. Back on Earth? Adrian Veet sits by his bank of monitors watching as Wonder Woman steps before the United Nations in order to give a speech. Our world is under assault by mistruths, fear, and extremism. There's no singular villain behind it. We've all played a role. Suddenly the wall behind her explodes inward. Hope I'm not interrupting, Diana. Black Adam calls, with Giganta and Creeper behind him. I heard your friends were on vacation.
Dr. Manhattan stands on Mars, looking up into the vast void of space. Time is fluid in his eyes, and he can see everything that was, is, and will be all at once. It is November 2nd, 1985, in his world, and he enters the multiverse. In April of 1938, he is drawn to the world of Superman for reasons he doesn't understand. The first person that he meets is a young man named Carver Coleman, who has spent the night sleeping on the streets. He takes the young man to a diner. Something is wrong, though. He barely hears the words that the young man is saying. Time is different in this universe, and John is having troubles understanding it. He looks at Carver Coleman, and he knows that this man will be his anchor. In moments, John looks into the past of Carver, seeing a boy who grew up with a mother that danced to make a living. He sees the boy leave home, travel to Los Angeles. He sees him struggle and lose his job, forced to live on the streets. It is now he is sitting across from him in the diner. Now he is on Mars, surrounded by a group of superheroes. He moves quickly, creating other versions of himself, stopping the heroes from moving against him again. I need you incapacitated for reasons that will become clear, he explains. It is now April in 1938. John is standing in front of Carver in an alleyway. Are you an angel? The young man asks. John looks away for a moment, thinking over the question. No, he finally responds. He is sitting in front of Carver in the diner, and the young man explains his troubles. It is a year later. Carver is happily telling him that he got the part in the big movie. It is 1943. Carver is dressed in a fancy suit, explaining that they want to make another Nathaniel Dusk movie. It is 1952, and Carver is telling John that he has to go to a party after winning his first big award. It is 1954. The man leans forward, anger and worry flashing in his eyes. I won't be on this world in a year? What does that mean, John? He asks. It is July of 1954, and Carver lays dead on his living room floor, murdered by his mother. It is 1955 and John is staring at an empty booth across from him. He is alone for the first time since coming to this world. It is 1938, and the young Carver Coleman is sitting across from him, but John turns his head, listening as the news radio reports a mysterious man who is lifting a car over his head. Carver stares as John suddenly disappears before his eyes. Across the country, John stands, staring at the crumpled car as the police look over the crime scene. A woman is speaking to the police. He was wearing a wrestling outfit and a cape. He lifted the car like it was a crate of apples, and then he leapt over that building over there, she points. But as John looks around, time suddenly shifts. The crowd, the car, Superman, they were never there. John looks through time again. It is now July, 1940. Alan Scott reaches for a Green Lantern as a train that he is on careens over a bridge. In January, a college student named Jay Garrick lays unconscious in a school lab, breathing in heavy water vapors. By morning, he is the fastest man alive. That same month, archaeologist Carter Hall comes in contact with an ancient knife that awakens his past as an Egyptian prince. October, Al Pratt begins to train under one of the greatest fighters in the world. May, Kent Nelson discovers a golden helmet with supernatural powers. April, 1939. Wesley Dodds awakens from a nightmare of murder on the grounds of the World's Fair. Donning a gas mask, he stops the killer. February 1940, the body of Jim Corrigan lays still. He will rise from the dead to seek vengeance. March, Rex Tyler will invent a pill that increases his strength tenfold, and he begins to trial testing on himself. In November of 1940, these heroes gather at an unsuspecting brick house within the city. They sit around a large round table, introducing themselves and discussing whether they should wait for Superman. Johnny Thunder offers to take a team photo, but they still wait for Superman. John watches and the same scene plays out, but this time they take the photo. It's November, 1940. The heroes have not heard of Superman, no one has. It's now April, 1948, and John is sitting across from Carver Coleman in the diner. He asks if the actor has ever heard of Superman. Superman? No, the man begins, but before he can continue, John is gone again. It is now 1931. John is standing in a cornfield and he watches as a rocket falls from the sky and is found by the Kents. He realizes that Carver Coleman never heard of Superman because an outside force shifted his arrival forward in time. Vibrations of this change not only affect this world, but every world in the multiverse. Instead of 1938, Superman is first seen in 1956. John pauses, watching the farmers hug the small child from another planet. No, 
the scene shifts and it is now October 1986. Jonathan Kent is showing his young son the rocket that brought him to the planet. The scene shifts again and again before John's eyes. It is the same event, altered slightly to fit within the timeline. The faces alter slightly, the rocket design itself changes, and John watches as Jonathan Kent holds his son, who weeps in his arms at the edge of the cornfields. I want to be Clark Kent. I want to be a son. Young Clark cries, but Jonathan holds him closer. You are my son, he promises. John stops and he stares. He doesn't understand this universe. Time shifts again. It is now May 1949 and a young Clark sits by his parents' bedside as they are passing away. Tears in his eyes. October 1986. His parents are alive, helping him put the finishing touches on a uniform that he will wear as Superman. John stands by the gravestones of the Kents. He misunderstood this world. He looks forward in time, following the trail of Superman's influence, and he realizes that this universe is more than it appears, and it is all connected to Superman. John looks back through the past, and he sees the forces such as the Anti-Monitor and the Extant, who are responsible for the shifts in Superman's timeline. He sees this, and he grows curious. It is now July 1940. John reaches out, and he shifts the Green Lantern just out of Alan Scott's reach. A simple act that will reshape the universe around him. The train crashes and Alan Scott never becomes the Green Lantern. History shifts and the multiverse shifts with it. This universe stands apart from the multiverse, John realizes. This is the metaverse. John stands amongst the wreckage of the train, the Green Lantern in his hands. He turns his head, watching as his version of the universe begins to take shape around him. Superman is sent to Earth as before, but much later. The kids find him, though they are not quite the same loving parents as before. On the night of his senior prom, Jonathan and Martha are killed in a car accident, and John watches as without his parents or other costumed heroes, Clark grows distant from humanity. He becomes angry, lashing out against the world. John watches as Superman finally becomes the hero that he was meant to be. But his tampering with the metaverse did not go unnoticed. Lightning cracks behind him and John turns to see a swirling vortex open up. I know what you did! Wally West screams over the sharp hiss of energy. Whatever you did, they'll stop you, he promises. He tries to reach out for him, and at that moment, John realizes that the metaverse is not passive. The metaverse is an organism fighting to survive. It is now... April 1938. John stands before Carver Coleman, who looks concerned. John, tell me what you see, he asks. John is in the future, and he sees an angered Superman standing before him. The man of steel charges, his eyes glowing red as he lashes out with a punch. Then, darkness. It is now June 1954, and Carver Coleman is shaking John by the shoulder. John, my God, what are you doing here? I don't know. John tells him. He knows that Carver will be dead in 10 seconds. The man turns, meaning to make John a drink. He reaches for the bottle of alcohol when his award hits him in the head. Carver's mother ransacked his home, taking what cash and valuables she could find. The murder was never solved. John walks through his own past and his own universe. He is a being of inaction who will meet a being of action. In this metaverse, he knows that he has become the villain. And in the Hall of Justice, Superman opens his eyes. The world is now in chaos. The president has declared that without Superman, America will return to the more traditional deterrence of foreign threats. The soldier reaches out to turn the key, but Batman's hand shoots out, snapping it. My arm! You broke it! The man screams. The crowds riot in the streets with mayhem and destruction raining across the country, and Batman tosses the man, throwing him into a crowd of soldiers that are trying to rush him. He turns as the doors to his right swing open and a new group rushes in. At the manor, Alfred is sitting by the fire. He turns the pages, reading the next line in the journal of Rorschach that was left behind by Reggie, our new Rorschach. Meanwhile, at the United Nations, Wonder Woman throws her lasso of truth around Giganta's arm, tossing her through the wall and into the streets. Civilians run as debris and a giant woman fall around them. Wonder Woman turns, but her body is suddenly hit by magical lightning from behind. You preach peace, as if that is what the leaders of this bloated, selfish, frightened country want. Black Adam shouts at her. They are the descendants of those who enslaved your people, Diana, who raped and killed so many of you. They fight for privilege. 
I fight for the oppressed. I need to know right now, who side are you on? But Diana throws up her bracelets, deflecting the next bolt. Outside the Hall of Justice, the crowd continues to grow, anger crossing their faces as they raise signs crying against Superman's actions. Elsewhere, Lex Luthor and Lois Lane walk through the halls of one of Lex Corp's most secure buildings. He explains to her that he was approached by a man claiming to be from another dimension. I was then shot by someone that I presume to be from the same parallel Earth, given that they knew each other. He leads her through the building, explaining what he learned from Ozymandias and the comedian. Meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice, Clark struggles, pulling himself out of his bed. And over in his lair, Adrian Veet sits, watching his monitors. The news continues across the world, showing riots and meteorological destruction across the globe. He continues to watch until he realizes that one of the voices isn't coming from the television. Yes, I hear you, he says as he stands. All these screens, I thought you were one of them. He walks through the lair, Babastus in his hand, and he passes the cell of Johnny Thunder, where the old man sits crying. He finally stops at the door of Saturn Girl. What do you want? I know why I can't read your mind, she tells him, speaking from the shadows thrown off the window on the wall. Adrian smiles. Meanwhile, at LexCorp, the large door slides open, and inside, Lex places his finger on a fingerprint screener. This is the most secure building that I possess, housing the secrets to the very nature of the universe, which I will prove to you revolves around me, he tells her as the door slides open. Have you ever heard of Carver Coleman? He asks. Lois looks around confused. Lex explains to her that the actor was killed in 1954, but the murder was never solved. Eventually, the items that remained in Carver's estate went up for auction. One of those items belongs to me. He tells her, holding up an old photograph. Lois takes the picture confused, asking, what is so special about this? And Lex tells her, I've been tracking strange anomalies since I was a boy. The story behind this picture has always eluded me. Two years ago, Lex was moving through a dark field in the night. A flash of energy behind some trees drew his attention and he pushed through. On the other side, he witnessed the flash and Wally West hugging. How could I ever forget you? The Flash asked, but Lex discovered that the Flashes were not the cause of the energy spikes. He turns, and he sees a photograph lying in the grass. This picture is connected to the rebirth of Kid Flash? Lois asks. In a way, it is. I found coronal debris in the area, including the film I sent you and personal items connected to Wally West. Evidence that our reality has been altered, but it was the photograph that was the true anomaly. Lois walks in behind Lex, but stops short, her eyes and mouth wide open in shock. The room is lined with duplicates of the photograph that Lois is holding in her hands. I found them all over America. Each is absolutely identical. From what I've been able to piece together, the one in your hand was the first back in 1938. But if you look at John's suit, it comes from a much later era. The 50s, it would appear. Lex tells her that he believes that someone is leaving these photos as they travel through time, but Lois asks him why. I don't think that they're aware of it, Miss Lane, but whoever they are, they are more powerful than any other being that I've encountered. Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, Superman finishes getting dressed as the door behind him explodes inward. A squad of soldiers fall into the room, aiming their weapons at the Man of Steel. Superman turns, putting his hands up as they've ordered. By order of the President, I'm asking you to come quietly. I don't want any trouble, Superman tells them. Lower your weapons, please. He steps forward and the men tense before him. If the President has an issue with me, I will go discuss it with him, he tells them. He suddenly leaps into the air in a red blur flying through the roof over their heads. Back at Wayne Manor, Alfred finishes cooking the stack of pancakes that he was making. He puts them into a box and he steps out into the cold night. In the city, Reggie is sleeping fitfully under the bridge. Nightmare is filling his dreams as he pulls the small blanket that he owns tighter. He sees his father speaking with the Kovaxes, his eyes bright with confidence. The door opens and a gout of flame erupts, burning his father alive. Reggie screams and Rorschach is standing before him, his hands coming through the bars to clutch Reggie's throat. He screams, coming awake to find Alfred leaning over him. The man stops, not wanting to startle Reggie. Do you remember me? I'm Alfred Pennyworth. You like my cooking. I've read the journal. I'm sorry we didn't believe you before, but we do now. 
Alfred reaches into his bag, pulling out the box of pancakes. Bruce has asked me to find you, to help us locate Ozymandias so that we can prove Superman's innocence. So, we can stop him from doing to our world what he did to yours. He opens the box, showing the pancakes. And I thought you might be hungry. Reggie slaps the box away, screaming at Alfred. Put me in prison! Let me to rot! Not Rorschach! He yells before running away into the night. In his lair, Saturn Girl questions why she can't see the truth within Ozymandias' mind. So he explains it to her. I knew that John would never listen to me, so instead I used Mime and Marionette. I knew that John hadn't saved the two villains because of Marionette's pregnancy, but rather for the future that he had seen for her son, that the boy would be adopted by a woman that had been important to John at one point in his life. So you broke them out of jail? Not me, my other puppet. He tells them that Reggie Long believed that Adrian was dying of cancer. A facade that I maintained until John exposed the truth. Reggie believed that I was overwhelmed with guilt and shame over the tragedy of New York. Adrian used that to get Reggie to break the two villains out of jail, and once the group was together, they came to this world. Poor Reggie, he had no idea that he was wearing the mask of the man that had destroyed his parents. Once we arrived in this world, though, I realized that John had found someplace special. A schizophrenic society overrun with superpowers and costume. He came here to be with his own kind. When John refused to help us, believing that a confrontation with Superman would lead to his or this universe's oblivion, I came up with a new plan. One to save both worlds. I knew that the belief in Superman was holding this world together, and that the world would have to be turned against him. I discovered that the Superman theory had a partial truth to it, and I forced the confrontation in Moscow, knowing that Superman would be forced to intervene. I used Webastus to create the detonation, knowing that the heroes of the world would trace that energy to John in Mars, resulting in a battle that would remove Superman's allies. The stage is set. Meanwhile, on the White House lawn, Black Adam and his team of supervillains stalk forward, but the wind suddenly rushes by them and Superman stands in the way of their objective. I'm still catching up, but I know enough to know that this has gone on too far, Superman tells Adam, determination on his face. You have one chance to stand aside, Superman, Adam warns him, and the villains begin to circle the Man of Steel. The blow is strong enough to knock Superman through the city. In six seconds, Superman will see me. John thinks, breaking through the White House lawn walls and colliding with a building in Pennsylvania Avenue. He stands up, turning. Dr. Manhattan stands before him, staring at the Man of Steel. It is now, John thinks. He watches as Superman realizes who he is. It is Superman. It is me. It is us. It is the world. It is time. It's time. Superman turns to see Dr. Manhattan standing before him, the group of supervillains not far behind. Hello, Superman, Dr. Manhattan says, the man is still pausing, unsure of who the new man is. Who are you? I'm the one you're going to destroy, or I'm the one who's going to destroy everything, John tells him. Superman is confused, but he turns as his name is shouted behind him. A group of heroes have landed. The Posar of Russia at the lead. You must answer for the crimes against the Russian people, he demands, ordering Superman to turn himself in. But another voice calls on the other side and Superman turns to meet this. Superman will be held accountable, but Kondok will be the nation that does it, Black Adam orders. His group of supervillains backing him up. During these speeches, John is merely watching Superman, his head cocked to the side. There are innocent people in the area. Superman tells those that have surrounded him, gritting his teeth. Since when has that ever stopped your country? Black Adam tells him as the gathering of heroes and villains launch themselves at Superman. Across the world, the heroes of the other countries begin to move towards the US, wishing to help since the disappearance of the Justice League. In Washington, Superman's hands snap out, grabbing both Black Adam and Posar in a beam of heat vision, cuts through the spectral form of Negative Woman. But it's not enough, as a blow begins to draw blood from the Man of Steel. Meanwhile, in Gotham City, Reggie stands before a bank of televisions in a store, watching the news play out across the world. The groups of superheroes from other countries have begun to converge on Washington, and Reggie looks up as one reporter confirms that this is the end. A metal pipe cracks hard against Reggie's head, drawing blood in behind him. A large man smiles as looters continue to run through the streets. I knew I'd catch one of you trying to break into my store. He readies the pipe for another swing, but the metal is caught by a leather-gloved hand. Excuse me, sir. You've got blood on your hat. 
Alfred Pennyworth tells him, spinning the pipe around, knocking the man across the face. Reggie looks up at the man who's been trying to find him for most of the night, blood still oozing from his head. Told you, leave me alone, he gasps, and Alfred nods, looking down at the unconscious man. If I did that, where would we be? I require your assistance. Superman does. Alfred pulls out the Rorschach mask, asking Reggie to help them find Ozymandias before it's too late. Reggie reels at the mask, trying to get back up. But before Alfred can say the name, Reggie grabs him, slamming him into the front window. Monster's name! Monster's face! Filled with emptiness! Tears begin to fill his eyes as Superman takes blow after blow in Washington. Your world's going to end like mine! Reggie tells Alfred. Alfred looks into the scared man's eyes. It will unless we do something to save it. But when Reggie looks at the mask, he sees a world with no future. He sees the man that took all the hope from his father. He sees a world that is teetering on the edge of darkness, fighting over stupid policies. Why not let the ugly world destroy itself before we're dragged down into the darkness with it? Reggie asks Alfred when suddenly light shines from above and Reggie looks up to see Batman swooping into the streets. I know, you tried to warn me. I'm sorry. John watches as Superman falters under the gathering of the superpowered, blows raining upon him, both physical and energy. John watches as a car sails through the air at a mother and her young daughter, and they are cowering in fear. Shut your eyes, the mother tells her daughter, holding her close as the car is about to crush them. But Superman is there, catching the hunk of metal, tossing it aside. He turns, immediately jumping back into the fight. Whoever you are, help these people! He yells at Dr. Manhattan, but John just watches as another blast hits Superman in the chest. I don't help. I've already seen it. Lightning cracks against Superman, and he stumbles, dropping to his knees, blood leaking between his clenched teeth. I can't do this alone, he whispers. A photo of John and Laney drifts down through the air, landing in the pavement. John looks up at the sky, seeing the other photos. Less than four minutes now. At LexCorp, Lex Luthor tells Lois Lane to use everything that he told her to write a story, to tell the world that he was the one who discovered their history has been tampered with by a being from another dimension. I want credit for my work, he tells her, reaching for the vibrational emitter gun in his weapons room. In the streets of Gotham, Mime and Marionette continue to lead the police on a high-speed car chase. The comedian still tied up in the back. Do you believe what Dr. Manhattan does? Batman asks Reggie. That everything is preordained. I read Korvac's journal. I know who Dr. Manhattan is. You know who Rorschach is then? No, I can't wear a mask. Reggie tells him that his friend Byron lied to him, made him put on the mask of the man who destroyed his family. You see a monster when you look at the mask, but you can take it. You can change it. Make people see something else. Batman tells him, handing him the mask. And in Washington, Superman is struggling to his feet, fire and smoke drifting around him as the battle continues and he turns to Dr. Manhattan again. How could you stand there and not do anything? My world once had a chance at peace, but after I left, I lost it. It fell into war. It's burning even now, John tells him. He holds his hands up before Superman, the city burning around them. I am the one behind the changes in your life. The loss of mentors you've never known. The friends you've forgotten. More specifically, I am the one responsible for the deaths of your parents. He tells him, I changed your life, Superman. Out of cold curiosity, will you destroy me for it? Or will I defend myself despite my sins? Superman's eyes suddenly begin to burn red, and he launches himself at Dr. Manhattan. The man closes his eyes, waiting for the end to come. But Superman's fist rushes past him, connecting with the Posar and knocking him away. Why would you defend me? John asks, surprise in his voice. Superman pants by him, trying to catch his breath. I don't know what to think about all of this, but I do know that right now, right now, you have a choice to make. Who is she? Superman asks, and John looks down at one of the photos of Lamy that has fallen to his feet. You created those photos every time you took a step. I assume that she is important to you, Superman tells him. He then stands before him, looking into the eyes of Dr. Manhattan. Maybe the darkness that you see. Maybe it takes everything that you have to save your world. Maybe you can make that choice, he tells him, looking over his shoulder, seeing the group ready to attack him again. But John waves his hand, and everything begins to slow. Yes, I understand now. Everything ends. 
He knows as he begins to glow brighter and brighter, blinding the world around him, everything beginning to disappear, leaving only Superman's symbol on the ground, until that too drifts away, and darkness envelops everyone, because there is nothing but darkness. A planet explodes as if lighting the darkness, as if starting the universe, and from the destruction, a rocket ship barrels through space, and as always, it begins with a child. The metaverse forms around the child who will one day become Superman and lands on Earth in different times and in different eras. In one, Jonathan Kent is telling his young son to hide his powers, that the world isn't ready to see someone like him. But Dr. Manhattan goes back, shifting the Green Lantern back within the grasp of Alan Scott, saving himself and becoming the Green Lantern. Jonathan Kent then tells his son that the world had heroes once, the Justice Society of America, and that if Clark was ready to show the world everything that he is capable of, well, the world is ready too. Clark smiles, thanking his paw, getting out of the truck to go to his dance. In one world, this is the night that Superman lost his parents. The truck is rear-ended, sending it careening into a tree. But in this world, Clark isn't hiding. He isn't afraid, and he's inspired by the heroes of the past, and he steps into the light, and the truck is stopped by Superboy. In this world, the Justice Society exists, and because of this, Superboy exists. Because Superboy exists, the Legion of Superheroes exists. As the metaverse reforms, time catches back up, and Adrian stands in his lair, watching the events unfold on the news. Babastus hissing in his hands as they both begin to feel the change. There is a bright light and a legionary ring is suddenly gone, and in his cell, Johnny Thunder turns to find the Green Lantern glowing bright, a voice calling out to him asking if he forgot. I did! Didn't I? He smiles before yelling, Say you! In Washington, Black Adam punches Superman across the face as the hero is overwhelmed, but everyone is suddenly thrown clear of the Man of Steel. A little telepathic push will clear them away, someone calls, and Superman looks up confused. Who? The smoke and the fire below begin to clear, showing a new group of heroes. You remember us now, don't you, Cal? Sorry relates, son. Jay Garrick tells the Man of Steel, tipping his winged helmet. Superman nods, smiling, turning back to the group of villains. An army of superheroes from the lost history of the metaverse now at his back. Better late than never. He calls as they charge into the fight. John watches as Superman leads the charge, defeating the villains. And for the first time, he is inspired. He sees the splitting of the multiverse. He sees Superman catching a car in 1938, when the Flash was first created, the vibrations creating the world of Earth 2. A crisis occurred, and the Earth divided again, creating Earth 1985. Flashpoint, Earth 52, rebirth, everything that is a change to the metaverse, a new multiverse is born to preserve Superman. John looks to the future and sees that in 2020, Superman's timeline will be threatened again by the energies of the new gods. In July of 2025, a new crisis will erupt and Superman will be revitalized. In 2026, the timeline will be restored and Earth 5G will be born. In 2030, a secret crisis will begin. Superman will fight against the author himself and a green behemoth stronger than even Doomsday. A young boy is found in a field in 2038, in 2045, in 2162, in 2965. In every era, a rocket arrives and a young child is loved. Superman is made. John looks on and he understands that Superman's purpose throughout the metaverse. He shows them the way. Adrian briefly glances over his shoulder. I did it again, he says to Batman and Rorschach. Did what exactly? Everything we needed to clear Superman was on your ship. Batman tells him, Yes, I know. It's all going according to plan. Suddenly the room is filled with a blue light, and Batman is left standing in the room alone. They all appear in front of the Washington Monument, standing beside Mime and Marionette and the comedian. I know what you've done, Adrian. Adrian nods, explaining that he knew that Superman could convince him. He just had to arrange the meeting. Let's go home. Everyone lives today. That's when a gunshot echoes throughout the empty space as a round cuts through Adrian's stomach. Except maybe you, Vite. Goddamn asshole. The comedian spits, his pistol smoking in his hand. He turns the gun to mime and marionette, when suddenly he begins to vibrate. Lex Luthor standing there, aiming his vibrational emitter at the man and smiling. He's sending him back to where he came from. Edward Blake disappears, returning to the point in time where Dr. Manhattan pulled him out of. The comedian sailing through the air, 
and he hits the pavement below his apartment. Reggie leans over Adrian. We all get what we want, Reggie. I get to die a hero. John gets a purpose. You get revenge. But Reggie pulls off the Rorschach mask, jamming it into the wound to stop the bleeding. You live. Pay for your crimes. Rot in prison. Reggie snarls at him. John turns to Mime and Marionette, telling them that they will not be returning to their world. We want our son back, Marionette yells at him, but John nods, telling her that his plan is for them to see their son again, and he will need an anchor in this world, as I did. In a flash, John is gone. It is 1954, and he arrives once more at the diner where he was going to meet Carver Coleman. The man sits across from him, shocked to have learned that he won't be on this world in one year. I have not been a good friend to Carver, but I can see so many futures now can make a good choice. John tells him, looking at his friend, don't be afraid of what you feel. Carver would come out when his mother blackmailed him, telling the world his secret. Shunned for a time, he would eventually find acceptance in Hollywood, passing on in 2005 with his partner of 40 years at his side. The news plays out, and Clark listens with his super hearing as he and Lois walk through the streets of Metropolis. He tells her that there's a long road ahead, but she knows. But it's not too late. You did it. You reached him. You changed him. And he'll change someone too. Because if you have faith in that, there's hope in us all. They stop in front of the Daily Planet as John and Martha Kent greet them. The loving parents run to their children, hugging Clark close. It's so good to see you, Clark smiles, holding his mother. In a blue flash, John emerges once more into his world. It is in ruins around him, but John looks around. And he walks, and with each step, flowers begin to bloom. He sees the future. He sees a young girl standing outside of Adrian's prison, obsessed with his rise and fall. On her 16th birthday, she'll call herself Nostalgia, standing with a full-grown babastis by her side. Time shifts and Marionette has given birth to her son. The nurse will look to the baby basket to find the child missing, and John is walking through the park, the child in his arms. He is standing on Mars with him, pointing to the stars. He looks down at the child a smile on his face, and in a brief moment he sees a life different, a life where he didn't get his powers, where he and Lainey were happy and they had children. He smiles as he walks through the world, flowers growing in his footsteps behind him, he begins to drift away as the last of his powers are given to the boy. And inside the Hollis household, the woman is making pancakes. The doorbell rings and the young daughter runs to the door. Oh, hi, can I help you? She asks the young boy who stands before her. The boy is dressed in a suit and the symbol of the atom is on his forehead. I'm sorry to bother you, but a friend of your mom and dad's brought me here. He said that they'll know what to do. She smiles at the strange boy. My mom and dad are making pancakes for lunch. Do you want some? My name's Sally. What's yours? The boy looks at her. John calls me Clark. And there you have it, the full story for Doomsday Clock. Now, it's weird because if you've been following our Flash Forward series, then you know that Dr. Manhattan has passed these abilities onto the Mobius chair, which then went over to Wally West. So right now, Wally West has all of Dr. Manhattan's powers. Overall, though, what did you think about the Doomsday Clock? Told in one complete story, I hope it tells you a little bit better story, a much fuller story. I, I really don't know what to say here, guys. Thank you for watching this whole video. We really appreciate your support, and I guess we'll see you on the next full story.